inside the human body. So like that's the quantum computer is a tool to help people um, develop better medicines. And, and, and so it would be part of the whole value chain, I, I, I think, in, in the same way that computers are today. Right. And could you just elaborate on that a little bit more? Because I'm curious, and we had this in our title for the spaces, so we, we do have to touch on it. But um, I'm curious on what you see as those first milestone applications for quantum computing. Will it be on fields like drug discovery or chemistry or, or, or what? Because I think when people talk about quantum computing, we just kind of associate it with what we do computing for now, which is running software. But it sounds like there's this much more of a potential real world impact uh, from quantum computers when they do become commercialized. Yeah, so I think the, the analogy here is um, is, a, is how the aerospace industry develops in the past hundred years. So, so a hundred years ago, you know, the Wright brothers um, discovered flight. Right? They they made a uh, a model and they jumped off a sand dune, and it either it flew or it didn't. You know, and they they did this through trial and error, and and the aerospace like today, the aerospace industry doesn't do that anymore. They use computers to simulate the physics of flight. And so they use these computers to design new airplanes. Um, and when we try to do the same with, um, in, let's say in drug discovery, so the movement of a protein or in materials design, so sort of how electricity moves around in a battery or in uh, industrial processes, so how a catalyst reduces the energy consumption in an industrial process, then we hit a wall because our classical computers are really bad at simulating the underlying physics. And the underlying physics is quantum mechanics. So the equations of motion that tells us what's gonna happen next, this is, this is governed by the, the laws of quantum mechanics. And so what we want to do is build a computer that's really good at simulating quantum mechanics. And if we could do that, then these industries have the potential to be transformed from places where you discover a new medicine or you discover a new material or you discover a new catalyst and instead design these using computers. I can um, just interrupt you real quickly, Steve, because um, you mentioned that classical computers are bad at simulating underlying physics. And I just wondered, um, you know, to what extent is that? Because with the use of artificial intelligence now, as I understand it, there are um, a lot of attempts to simulate, uh, you know, biological developments in protein folding. For example, DeepMind has been working on that. So, what is what is the what do you mean by um, that? And why would quantum computers be better at doing that than classical computers? Yeah, great question. So, um, if you try to sort of naively solve the uh, equations of motion, uh, quantum mechanics then every time you add one more electron or one more atom in your protein, you double the size of the computer that you need. And so this quickly gets way too big. Um, and so if you're going to try to exactly solve the equations, then, um, then uh, this is impossible once you get beyond even a very small system and, and sort of nowhere near uh, the movement of a protein or the scale of a protein, uh, which is like, say 10,000 atoms, something like that. Um, so so the then, compute power, so it's about compute power, not so much about the models that's, exactly. that are limited. Okay. Yes, that's right. So then, um, so we could, so, so then this AI and machine learning approaches, it is it's very similar to, and, and computational chemistry. So it's this whole field of approximating then these equations. So maybe the thing to do is throw out some of the, the physics and try to approximate these equations. And that turns out to work sometimes, actually. So um, there is this huge and, and very successful field of computational chemistry, and as you said, increasingly applying machine learning models to this. Um, but there are certain types of problem where we know that this is a really bad approximation. Um, and these are exa like typical examples are when there's a metal involved. So if the protein has a metal in it, which uh, there are lots of examples of this, or you're trying to understand a, a battery material, there's, there's metals in there. And, and it's the characteristics of these systems mean that they are very poorly approximated by 
classical computers. Um, and, and so these are the types of problems that would be unlocked by a quantum computer. So it, it's more, it is finer grained than saying, yeah, we're going to solve all of chemistry. It's like we, we already understand rubber very well, but we'd actually like to understand metals as well. Um, and maybe another way of thinking about this is to say you know, machine learning kind of generalizes existing data. Um, it doesn't tell you what's happening somewhere else in the space, like where you've got no related data. But quantum mechanics is a model of the world that happens to be so amazingly accurate that it predicts the entire space, it tells you everything that's going to happen. So not just the starting structure, as in the alpha fold, so that tells you sort of a, a static view of the protein, but what's going to happen to that protein over the time scale of a second, how it's going to move around and how that might open up new places to bind a potential drug. So I think all of these things will be combined together. You could sort of think of quantum mechanics as the ultimate model of the world. And really what we're trying to do is build a computer that can solve that model. That is absolutely mind blowing. What a, what a crazy, what a crazy notion. Um, a quick basic question for you um, before we have to wrap up, um, we might just be able to fit one or two more questions in, but to what extent does Moore's law apply to quantum computing? Does it apply at all? Uh, yes. So, um, We've seen essentially a progress in, so, so I think the question to ask is like, how good are people at building a quantum computer and, and how has that changed over time? And I think that's when you see a, an equivalent of Moore's law in quantum computing. So how good are we, uh, how many operations can you do on your quantum computer um, is a metric that has been approximately doubling every one to two years. And we've seen that for the past two decades. And I think this is why it's such an exciting time for quantum computing right now and, and why these roadmaps of, hey, like this is a massive step forward, um, but we think we could do that by the end of the decade are actually credible. And it's because for the past um, 20 years, we've seen that level of progress and, it's, and it doesn't, that doesn't seem to be slowing down. Okay, that's great. Well, um, Steve, I think we have just come to the end of our time for the spaces and thank you so much for joining us to talk about quantum computing. Um, and I, I have to say, I really loved the analogy you gave earlier about the digital cameras, um, Kodak inventing that first camera that was just 0 0.01 megapixels. How it was rubbish compared to film cameras. And that's kind of where quantum computers are compared to uh, classical computers today. But that of course is changing just as you've said now, um, developing uh, gradually each year. Um, so definitely going to be keeping an eye on this and thanks again for joining us steve and for explaining all that thank you great questions i really enjoyed it and and thank you to everyone else for listening in on the spaces i do hope we'll be able to come on again next week and that elon musk will not shut down twitter spaces as i said it's a great feature keep it free um but uh if you can join us next week we'll be on talking about voice cloning with respeecher which is a ukrainian startup doing some really fascinating work um in ai um, but thank you all for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your day.